Welcome. Hey, hey now. Welcome everyone. How's everybody doing today? Thanks for coming. This is certainly a unique format. Uh, just think of this like Frost Nixon, except, <laughs> except I'm not British and he's not evil. Um, and if I could as well, I just want to send greetings from a 96-year-old gentleman in Oakland, California named Lester Red Rodney, who was the sports editor. Is he still around? He is still around. Wow. And I told him I was speaking with Howard, and Lester emailed me, ah, to be 80 again. <laughs> was terrific, but I just wanted to say welcome to you, Howard Zinn. Thank you. Start, I'd just ask you a question if I could. Oh, no, please. You, you can. Okay. Yes. yes, you can. Okay. Uh, I'm happy to be here with Dave Zirin. In fact, we're going to spend most of our time congratulating one another. <laughs> no. this, this is my second appearance. I say appearance as if this is right, a show. Oh, second appearance with Dave Zirin. I don't know if you remember this, Dave, because most people don't remember the times they encountered me. But uh, we were on the same platform with Jim Bowden. Do you know who Jim Bowden is? Right? <laughs> like, like Dave Zyron, he's an oddity. <laughs> I hope you don't mind my saying that, Dave. No, but, not at all. No. no. But Jim Bowden is a, is a, was a pitcher, major league pitcher, with a political point of view. And Dave Zirin is a sportscaster with a, yes, a political point of view. And so anyway, we had a great time together. So anyway, Dave, I'm happy to be here with you. And I assume that we're going to talk about baseball in the age of Obama. <laughs> <laughs> Which, does, does that microphone work too? Uh, does this microphone work too? I think that's just for the. But you know what, I'm going to give this to you. Can people hear me all right? Yeah. I'm going to stay like this, because that way we don't have to oh. pass it back and forth like we're at a men's group meeting, passing the stick <laughs> yeah. for who gets to speak. Um, or maybe later, if you're free, we could do that. Well, let's see. Can you, can you hear me? No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is a real put down. <laughs> OK, all right. It's all yours, Dave. Well. <laughs> I, was, I wanted to ask you this. This is something I've wanted to ask you for quite some time. I mean, you, Why didn't you? Uh, I didn't know you well enough. Okay. But a, as a paragon of social justice, how can you be a Red Sox fan? <laughs> <laughs> because the general manager of the Red Sox, I know people will be very interested in this, the general manager of the Red Sox invited me do you, how many know who the general manager of the Red Sox is? Five people. <laughs> yeah. That's our demographic. Yeah. General manager of the Red Sox, a guy named Theo Epstein, and, and, and he invited me to sit in his box at a Red Sox game because he had read a people's history of the United States. How many general managers of baseball teams have read anything? <laughs> So how can I stop being a Red Sox fan? <laughs> Besides, they do win a lot. Uh, anyway, Dave. Great answer. The, <laughs> is there something else you wanted to ask me? There is. There is. Okay. As somebody who has fought around issues of racial justice as a participant for decades, I would just love it if you could take us to where your head was at on November 4th 2008, when you realized that Barack Obama was going to be the next president of the United States. Well, yeah, where my head was at, yeah. That was exciting. I was excited. I was exhilarated. No, yeah, of course. I mean, how could I not be? <laughs> we were getting rid of this evil gang. <laughs> I, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm here. Yes, I'm, yes, the first African American. I wouldn't have welcomed any first African-American, right? I mean, they're African-Americans, you know, 
What if Clarence Thomas were running for president? No, no. But no, Barack Obama, very decent guy, articulate, intelligent, etc. With a wife who is very politically savvy and charming and all of that. Besides, no, this is a historic moment. And for me, there was, there was a special moment because the, at one point that evening when his victory was announced, the camera flashed on students at Spelman College in Atlanta, where I taught for seven years in the, in the days of the year. And it showed the, the students at Spelman, these young women at Spelman, showed their faces. They were ecstatic. And it, it, was, it was just thrilling to see that. So that was that moment. Now, there's another moment. <laughs> Please continue. I, I'm, everybody's yeah. talking about it, the 100 days. The I mean, days. at first, as a historian, is that in any way, shape, or form a metric by which to judge a oh. president? Or, and second, what do you think of the first 100 days? <laughs> yeah, no, it's not a good measure. Therefore, I'll discuss it. OK. <laughs> um, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it about journalism? They get fixed on things, oh, 100 days, 100 days. But, okay. Uh, we've, we've seen a lot from Barack Obama in these first 100 days. I mean, there are people who say, oh, well, you mustn't judge him by, by this brief period of time. Uh, people say that to me when I have dared to utter some criticism of Obama. You have, you have to dare to utter criticism of Obama because, and I understand it, because there's this great exhilaration, this great feeling, yes. And so we, it's, it's kind of uh, tough to voice criticism of Obama, but you should, because we're, Obama is a politician. We are not, we are citizens. In the days of the abolitionist movement, the, the, the abolitionists said, you know, Lincoln and the White House, he's a politician. We are citizens. Lincoln will do what he wants and say what he wants, and we must do what we want and say what we want, hoping that the politicians will in some way be moved or pressured or affected by what we say and do. So, I mean, all of this is a preface to saying uh, there, are a lot, there are a lot of things that Obama has done in these first 100 days that I have not been happy with. Because what they suggest to me, what he's done in these first 100 days suggests to me that in many ways he's a very traditional Democrat. That's a very traditional leader of the Democratic Party. And I don't know if you know the tradition of the Democratic Party. I'll sum it up very briefly. <laughs> the tradition of the Democratic Party is be more liberal than the Republican Party on domestic matters. Not too liberal, but more liberal than the Democratic Party. On matters of foreign policy, don't be too much different. Really. I mean, that's what the history of the Democratic Party is, the history of being as expansionist and militarist and imperialist as the Republican Party. Really, just look at that history. I know Bush carries it so far that it's very, it's very hard to match, you see. But the fact is that historically, the, you know, the Democratic and Republican parties uh, on matters of foreign policy uh, have generally been together. They call it bipartisanship. And you're supposed to be happy with bipartisanship. It's a, uh, no. Uh, it's, uh, and uh, so, uh, so I, I welcome the, the steps that Obama has taken domestically Steps, they're just steps in the, in the democratic tradition of caution. Steps, we'll, we'll spend more money for education, we'll, uh, and we'll try to create jobs, that's all good. Um, and, uh, and we'll talk about closing uh, Guantanamo, maybe even start to close it. <laughs> you know, that, that's all good. But on the other hand, uh, the appointments, I don't have to tell you this, right? The appointments that Obama made, who are these appointments? Old guard Democrats, 